Welcome to the first AMSYS podcast of 2007. I'm Peter Argyle and I will be taking you through this introduction to TCP IP. Although this podcast is generic and will be useful to anyone who wants to understand the basics of TCP IP, we are aiming this at those who are coming to the Mac OS X Support Essentials course. If you have any comments on this podcast or suggestions for future podcasts, then please email us at podcasts at ampsys.co.uk. If you'd like more information about the Support Essentials course or any other Mac courses, please visit ampsys.co.uk. TCPIP is the name given to a collection of networking protocols used by most of today's computers. You can think of it as a common language which allows your Mac, PC or Unix machine to communicate across a network. It is also the language of the Internet. In the diagram, we can see the basic layers of TCP IP. The first layer at the bottom deals with the network interface, whatever type of connection that might be. A common example would be an Ethernet connection. The next layer, we have ARP, the address resolution protocol, used when your machine needs to discover other machines on the network, and IP, the internet protocol. It contains the IP address of your machine and formats the packets to be sent across the network. The address has two parts to it. The network address to identify which network your computer is on, and the host address, which is a unique ID for that computer. Above IP, we have the host to host or transport layer. Here we see two protocols, TCP, the transmission control protocol, and UDP, the user datagram protocol. These control how data is transported between machines. TCP is known as a connection based protocol. Think of it like a phone call where two people are chatting. After one person has spoken, the other responds. TCP sets up a conversation between machines. It does this by sending a sync packet to the destination, which then responds with an acknowledgement. TCP is used where we need to know that each piece of data sent has been received. This guarantees that data is received in order by the destination machine. If a piece of data gets corrupt, the destination will respond letting the source know which bytes have not been received. The disadvantage of TCP is that responding to each piece of data slows down the whole process. UDP is a connectionless protocol. This means we address a packet of data and send it. This is more like addressing a letter and posting it. Unlike TCP, we do not wait for a response before we send the next piece of data. This increases the throughput. When we have sent all the data, the destination machine responds, letting us know if it has received all of the data, or that some packets are missing. If data is missing, we can resend those missing parts. The top layer contains the high-level protocols, such as SMTP for sending mail, and HTTP for the web. Now we will look at the configuration of an OS X machine. This is the network system preference pane and to start we are going to configure it manually. To understand what the numbers entered for the IP address, subnet mask, router and DNS servers mean, we need to look at how the IP address range is structured and how the computer interprets these numbers. An IP address essentially contains two pieces of information. Firstly, it identifies which network the computer is on, and secondly, a unique ID for that computer. The address consists of 32 ones and zeros in binary form. These are divided into four groups of eight and referred to as octets. We convert these ones and zeros into a decimal number, because four decimal numbers are much easier to deal with than 32 ones and zeros. We separate each decimal number with a dot. Here we're using an example address of 172.19.1.20. 
I have used W, X, Y and Z purely to identify the octets. Looking at the first octet, how do we calculate the binary to a decimal value of 172? Each bit in the binary numbering system can have a value of 0 or 1, off or on. Starting from the right, the first or least significant bit has a decimal value of 0 or 1, the next a value of 0 or 2, and the next 0 or 4. As you can see, each subsequent bit doubles in value. To calculate our 172, we simply take the decimal value of each bit that has a 1. So 128 plus 32 plus 8 plus 4 equals 172. The IP address range is divided into five classes. Each class defines the size of the networks in that class. We can see that in a class A network, the first octet or 8 bits is used for the network address and that a class A address starts in the range of 1 to 126. This leaves 3 octets or 24 bits for host addresses. So as far as the internet is concerned, there are only 126 class A networks available. And these were allocated a long time ago. This also tells us that each of those class A networks could have approximately 16.7 million hosts. In a class B network, the range starts from 128 to 191. The first 16 bits are used for network addresses, which leaves 16 bits for host addresses. This equates to approximately 65,000 hosts on each class B network. We can see that our example address falls within this range. Class C networks are the smallest. The address range starts at 192 and ends at 223. They use 24 bits for the network and only 8 bits for the host address. 8 bits gives us a possible 256 addresses, of which we can use 254. The first address, 0, is reserved for the network and the last address is reserved for the broadcast address which we will explain shortly. Class D and Class E are not assigned to individual computers. This diagram shows a summary of how the address range is assigned. As you can see, Class D addresses are reserved for multicasting. Multicasts are a method of sending information to a number or group of clients simultaneously. Class E is reserved for future use and has not been assigned. When we looked at the allocation of addresses, did you spot the missing address range? Class A ended at 126 and Class B started at 128. 127 was missing. 127 is reserved for your machine and is known as the loopback address or localhost. You may come across the name localhost on OS X. If you're familiar with the ping utility, you can ping 127.0.0.1. This pings your own interface. As we know, each machine has a unique address on the network. It also listens to a second address, the broadcast address. A broadcast is a one-to-all communication. It is also the last address on your network, which corresponds to the host part of the address being all ones. In our example, the broadcast address is 172.19.255.255. Broadcasting is primarily used for discovery. This allows one machine to send a message that is received by all machines on the local network. When a machine needs to talk to another, it must first discover that machine's physical address. This is done with a broadcast known as an ARP request. The network mask or NetID is not something that you configure on a modern computer, but it is useful to understand the concept. It is fairly easy for a human to look at the first octet, which in our example is 172, 
and know that that is a class B address and therefore the first 16 bits of our IP address will be used for networking. Your computer however needs some way to identify which ones and zeros are to be used as the network address. This is where the netmask comes in. You can see that the netmask is 255.255.0.0. In binary this creates a mask of 16 ones and identifies the network part of the address. Let's look and see how this relates to the real world. As we know the internet is made up of many networks. When it communicates with our example address it uses the first 16 bits of the address to identify the network. Think of this in terms of addressing a postcard home when you go abroad. The only part of the address the foreign post office is interested in would be the country so that all the mail to be sent abroad can be grouped into countries. The internet does the same with networks. Our example network is 172.19.0.0. We are now back to the system preference pane and looking at the subnet mask. If we think about our class B example network which can have 65,000 hosts connected to it, it's not practical to try and physically do that. Connecting 65,000 computers to a single network would simply not work. So what we need to do is divide this up into much smaller groups. We have seen that the first 16 bits of our address have been used as our internet address and we cannot change that but we do still have the 16 bits of host address to allocate. If we were to take the third octet and use those bits for local network addresses, this would divide our single class B network with 65,000 hosts into 256 networks, each with 254 hosts. This is subnetting. If we go back to our example, where we saw that the internet used 172.19, the first 16 bits of the address, to deliver a packet to our local router. Our router now looks at the subnet to figure out which local network it has to direct the packet onto. In this case, it's network 1. And finally, the machine with the correct address, dot 20, picks up the packet. So now we have manageable size networks locally, which are seen to the outside world as one network. This was achieved by increasing the network mask. As you can see, the third octet changed from all zeros to all ones. However, dividing our network into 256 local networks may not suit our purpose. We can alter the subnet mask so that we can decrease or increase the number of networks. Starting by dividing our single network into two, the first bit of the third octet changes to a one, which is a decimal value of 128. So our subnet mask becomes 255.255.128.0. If we divide our network into four, the first two bits change to ones and the subnet mask becomes 255.255.192.0. If we want eight networks, then the subnet mask becomes 255.255.224.0 and so forth until we have used all of the third octet for networking. If 256 networks are not enough, then we can extend the subnet into the fourth octet as shown. Now that you have learnt about subnets, there is a way of writing an IP address that includes the subnet. This is called slash notation. Here we write the IP address as usual, but we append a forward slash and a number. In this case, 24, which indicates that there are 24 binary ones in the subnet. That gives us a subnet of 255.255.255.0. 255 
the normal class C net mask. As we have seen, this subnet mask will divide our class B address into 256 networks. If we were to use slash 20 at the end of the address, then we get a subnet mask of 255.255.240.0, which divides our class B network into 16. The network system preference pane accepts slash notation. If you type the IP address with slash notation and press return, the system will complete the subnet mask automatically. It will also complete the router address, which by convention is the first address on the network. To finish this introduction to TCP IP, try and answer this question. The network address is 172.19.1.0/24. Some of the eight machines shown cannot communicate on the network. Can you identify which machines are not working and why? You can check your answers by emailing us at podcasts at ampsys.co.uk. You can also send us any feedback to the same address. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>